Hello, everyone, and welcome to Seriously Loco, the Seriously Crazy Fan Podcast for El Paso Locomotive FC. I'm your host, Phil Baki, and uh, I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Mika Burrell. Mika, uh, I guess we're back, uh, question mark? <laughs> well, we're not back, but the podcast is certainly uh, recording again. Yeah, it, we took a little summer sabbatical um, for myriad reasons. Summer travels not wanting to talk about the same thing every single week um, or what have you. But yes, no, it's it's good to be back on the airwaves with you, Phil. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm feeling a little recharged after uh, a little vacation. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been pleased to... Yeah, to you were a to... jet setter this summer, man. July, July was crazy. It, it, it went, uh, it went quickly. So yeah, it was, uh, I guess we were... I was in Milwaukee, then I was in, uh, then I was in Oakland, then we were in Florida with my family. So yeah, it was, uh, it was quite the, quite the summer, but fun stuff. Uh, so busy, but I can't complain. Nice. Um, what about you? I know you're, you're feeling under the weather recently, so feeling yes. better. Yes. I'm on the mend, man. And I'm sorry to the listeners if I sound if my dulcet tones aren't as good as they usually are. Um, yeah, man, getting Corona in 2024 is embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had reported a couple weeks ago that coronavirus went through the locomotive locker room. Well, I guess it's just going through the nation because I guess there's like a summer surge or whatever. So, yeah, it got your girl, but I'll be fine. Um, <laughs> this is like That's my crazy. third time having it, so yeah. whatever antibodies uh you know hopefully they'll, they'll <laughs> fight them off so but no yeah I'm, I'm doing all right i'm getting better just congested yeah well we have a lot to talk about but for the listeners who you know we don't often talk about what's going on behind the curtain uh but we do even if it is sparing at times or whatever we do often have some outline of how we're going to discuss like what's been going on around the team. And I think many people who listen to the show will be used to our format of like, we review the last game. We sort of talk about what's going on news at the club. And then we talk about the next game we've tossed out the, <laughs> the script. There is no outline. There is no, so we're not really sure where this is going to take us because I mean, Mika, the reality around the team right now is that it, we're adrift, like uh, comfortably the worst team in the league in the Western Conference. I should say we're not worse than Miami, but we are comfortably <laughs> the worst team in the West. Um, we are celebrating like a scoreless draw in Memphis. Uh, as, you know, um, there's just the vibes around the team are just uh, they're 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 pretty rancid. Um, and there's really no way around it. Yeah, no, it's it's been an awful season. I think really the only consistent bright spot this season has been the performances of Jamali Waite yeah. in the locomotive goal. Um, he has been awesome for us, but other than that, like we've seen glimpses of, of Lucas Stoffer. We've seen glimpses of what Javier Navarro can do. Amando Moreno, of course, when he's scoring goals, like he looks like the player that we, you know, expected we were buying, but it just hasn't clicked enough on a consistent basis to make any kind of serious threat towards the playoff places. I don't know if mathematically it's out of the question, but emotionally it certainly seems out of the question <laughs> that we are um, going to make the playoffs this year. And that is, you know, as we've said in more you know previous difficult seasons that's kind of like the bare minimum sporting achievement for a usl championship championship side um and especially one like us who we we like to think of ourselves as ambitious um the club certainly tries to you know evoke that that kind of mentality and image uh, as an ambitious sporting endeavor um but yeah no the the season has just been awful i don't think there's any way around it um, and I, I hinted to you, Phil, before we started recording that I had some diabolical notes here. 
so I'm just going to lay them out for you. Okay. Because since the last time we recorded, which was June 18th, mm-hmm. so that was six games ago. Yep. Locomotive has scored two goals. We've allowed 11. We have as many red cards in that time as goals. <laughs> courtesy of Eric Elvio and Javier Navarez, who is now suspended for three games. But more on that later. We've lost five games. We've drawn one, which was last time out against Memphis. Won none of those. And we've been shut out four times. Bright spot, Jamali Wade has been nominated for two save uh, saves of the week in that time. <laughs> and won one. Oh, my God. It's so. terrible. I mean, oh, it's... Two goals. That's really... Two red cards. Two goals, two <laughs> red cards. I mean... Yeah, and it doesn't get bad. It doesn't get better. It's like, you know, we, we've talked about, like, rough patches or, like, even rough months and stuff like that. I mean, it doesn't even get better when you zoom out across the whole season. We got... You know, we've scored 16 goals the whole year. We played 21 games. Um... And we have 13 points. We actually only have three more goals than we have points in this season. It's just bad. Like, there is no metric. that I challenge anyone out there to find a metric that looks good for us right now, because I don't think there is one, uh, it, except for, like, Jamali's individual stats. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I just, I wanted to, I did this as kind of like a, thought exercise of like okay how really how bad has it been and it's been bad it's been real bad. um and that's just the previous six games you know the whole season has been a shambles um and that's why it's been so hard i think for us to like get on the mic and talk because it's like what more can you really say right yeah. um and in the club's defense, they have given us a ton of news recently, so I mean, sure. those are things we'll get into. But um, on the pitch, like it's just the same thing every week, you know. Yeah. Um. So I think it's been challenging as like content creators, <laughs> quote unquote, to create content out of this, right? Um, yeah. And you... I don't know. I th- I feel like you feel that too with the with the diehard fans, like the the. Uh, enthusiasm just is at an extremely low ebb and yeah. who can blame them? Yeah. It's, it's brutal. I mean, I think like we, we often think about it, you know, in doing this, this is a, you know, I hate to be so dramatic about it, but it is a labor of love. It's something that we do because yeah. we, we like it. We, we want to do it. We want to, we want to put this out, this show out for the fans. And like, I'll tell you, when it cut when like rubber meets the road and it's like man do i really want to like get on and do a podcast about this it really is tough when it feels like the organization cares less than you do like and that's that's the sad reality i'm not saying that individuals within the club are not working extremely hard to make the situation better i'm sure that that is happening Mm -hmm. right And it's not to dig anyone specific out. It's just to say that as an organization, locomotives like level of engagement, level of intensity around like, or even level of accountability about how dog shit this season has been, has just been non-existent. Like there's been nobody who's stood up and taken responsibility for how bad this has been. And when that happens, like, I think it's natural for fans and people like us, like, I mean, for us as fans and like, in addition to making this show and all that stuff, it can start to be really disheartening because it's like, well, what is the direction here? Like, if we're just going to act like it's all fine, like I even in looking up, we'll talk some news in looking up those news articles on the club's website. It's like the, the headline, uh, like when you go to the club's website, is uh <laughs> fireworks hold on <laughs> what does it say fireworks headline saturday night versus miami dog 
fireworks. Is it crack? Like, what are we doing? We're not talking about, <laughs> like, we're not talking about a player. We can't talk about the game. It's literally, if you go to a, our club's website, it's like, please come to the game. There will be fireworks, which is crazy. Like, there is nothing to point to. There's nothing. And, and in addition, there's that lack of accountability, which I think just becomes extremely difficult when no one is really like in these tough times, like for people around the club to become less visible, less engaged with the fans, like more insulated, more like more sort of this like siege mentality. It just becomes extremely difficult to continue to give a shit. Like, cause mm -hmm. if it's like, Hey, if you guys are kind of going within yourselves and you're just going to like, slump to these like disappointing results game after game then how on earth are we all supposed to like how are you expecting us to like get up for for the next game like if we just watch game after game of like of the same thing over and over and over again it's just it it you know and and i know i'm being like a little bit harsh here but it's like it is the brutal truth that it's like if you're expecting fans to come out and you're expecting people to continue to care, like you got to do something like you got to meet people halfway. And at a certain point for a team that was very bullish about like their prospects as a competitor and, and as a, um, a contender for not just the playoffs, but like a deep playoff run and a potential championship this year the lack of the lack of any acknowledgement of just how wrong it's gone uh, outside of sacking a coach. There's barely any, like there's barely any statement from the club regarding that. It's like, it all kind of happened. And then it was just like, we moved on. Hey, we did the, the thing that is the, you know, this is our accountability and like, we'll just hope it gets better. And it just hasn't. So I think like just not seeing more from the club to continue to engage the fans uh has been the biggest disappointment because at the end of the day like bad seasons happen off seasons happen like every single sporting organization goes through difficult times but the good ones acknowledge what's going on and make a plan on how to get better and i think the struggle right now and where the fans and ourselves you know where we as fans are feeling adrift is it doesn't feel like there is much of a plan or much or much of a reaction to it being just as bad as it's been. Yeah. And I mean, if there's any pattern that we can discern from any of the things that locomotive have been doing since June, when Wilmer Cabrera came into the fold is to sign Wilmer Cabrera players. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's really like the only like pattern or, or any kind of semblance of like an idea of a plan that we can see yeah. um and that unfortunately that has yet to bear fruit obviously players that have just come in like we have to give them a chance to see what they can do but um the change needed to be more immediate and that just hasn't been the case and that's for myriad reasons right i mean sure. you know the there's been injuries but everyone deals with those there's been suspensions. Some of that is our own doing. Um, COVID, that didn't help when when that hit the, the locker room before right. Phoenix. Um, so, yeah, there are forces working against this club, and I will concede that. Sure. Um, but at the same time, like the things that we can control, we aren't doing that well enough. And that's what we do for 90 minutes on the pitch every weekend. Um so yeah, no, I, I don't think you're being harsh. I think you're being realistic and just calling it like you see it. And um, I mean, the fireworks thing, like it's obviously like a meme at this point, right? Like fireworks at locomotive, woohoo. But <laughs> yeah, like that's, and that's the way to get like casual butts in seats, right? Like sure. family night out, whatever, group events. And that's all fine and dandy, but like after, was it after the Derby? We posted that um, just an open question to our followers, like how many people feel like they don't want to come to the games anymore. Yeah. And it was quite a lot. And a lot of people saying, I don't want to renew my season tickets. And that's like a $2,000 investment or whatever the case may be. Yeah. They're not cheap, right? So 
yes, the casuals are the ones that are really like the financial lifeblood of the club, but you do want to keep some of those like people who are like legitimately invested, right? Yeah. So I, I find that trend troubling. Yeah, I agree. I would say between uh, between what's gone on um, on the field, I mean, we even talk about, and I don't know that we'll spend much time talking about the Memphis game. I just like want to point out that it's like, you know, a positive result in that it is a point gained uh, in a sea of terrible results. Um, but we also are basically one Jamali weight away from losing this game heavily like there there was positive signs like in the game but certainly memphis had some very very big moments um and if it weren't for jamali wait this would have been another like shelling um just another like absolute absolute uh yeah it it easily could have ended three nil and I think there are like, um, there are a couple of moments for a locomotive, but nothing, nothing super dangerous. And that's like, that's just sort of, if we had won, it would have been a smash and grab and a bit like undeserved or less deserved, I'll say. Um, yeah. Because, because it would have been because Jamali Waite stood on his head, which has been unfortunately like the story of much of the season. So, um, but you mentioned you mentioned the the moves and things that are starting to take shape here in terms of, like there has been quite a bit of news around the club and you talked about the signing of of guys that Wilmer Cabrera is familiar with and we got a bit of news today on that front as uh Wahab Akwai um joined via transfer from Colorado Springs switchbacks and in a corresponding transaction, El Paso Locomotive transferred for Justin Dillon to Colorado Springs. Um, I uh, So, Akwai, he's 27. He joined the Switchbacks during the offseason. He's made five appearances for them in the championship. Um, but prior to that, played for Wilmer at RGV, and it was there that he made like the bulk of his professional appearances. Um, like his history is basically as a professional is primarily at RGV in, uh, in terms of the, the bulk of his uh, time on the pitch. So what do you make of this move? I mean, the reality is like for a team that's only scored 16 goals this season, it, it has to be classed as a pretty bold move to transfer the guy who scored the second most goals on the team. Yeah. And second most goal involvements, I think too. I think Justin had a couple assists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's on paper. It doesn't really fill me with much confidence that this is like a, an even exchange. <laughs> I think Colorado Springs are getting a, a guy with big, Cap you know, big capability, big ability. Maybe he didn't show it quite as consistently in El Paso. And that's, of course, for several different reasons. Justin was just rehabbing from an injury when this transfer happened. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, in a team where the attack is already so anemic, to give up on a striker like that, I just feel is really strange. At the same time, though, I mean, Justin Dillon seems to really, like, divide opinion because there's a lot of people that are like, good, get this bum out, or, like, he was such a flop, which I find really interesting, and I, I think, I think of course, people are entitled to their opinions, but I'm wondering, did did you think Justin Dillon was a flop? I, I think it's hard to look at any player that joined this offseason and say that they were a flop, given that you'd have to essentially apply that label to every single attacker that joined the club this off season, maybe mm. minus Moreno. Like, so Joaquin Rivas hasn't lived up to like the goal scoring expectations. Dylan, I think we talked openly about the fact that like, Hey, it feels like at times he's a little bit wasteful, but he does like, 
a ton of work and they're asking him to do a ton of work in the system the way it was being played because we were basically I mean if many will remember for the first three quarter or three quarters of the games that we've played so far it was lump the ball up to Dylan and hope that he could get other people involved in the play like that that was our build up um for much of the beginning of the season Moshe Bane like hasn't hit the ground running you know he hasn't like lit up the world uh in terms of his like him getting involved in goals um obviously you know Ricardo Zacharias hasn't seen the field as much but he he hasn't been able to like light that same spark that he did at times last season I think like When that many players, when you're like flop, 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 it's like, hold up. Maybe the situation at the club is more so the issue. Because like, what outfield player are we pointing to? I mean, aside from maybe Lucas Stauffer, especially early in the season, but like, are we pointing to many outfield players and saying like, man, they just were like, what a signing. They've been amazing. It's like, no, everybody's Mm -hmm. been, everybody's been kind of ass. And like, but I don't think it's because they're bad players. Like, and that's why I want to, I want to like really emphasize that. I don't think anybody at the club right now is just bad, right? Like, I think they are all very good footballers playing in a completely broken and dysfunctional team. Like, and, and how, whoever you want to attribute that to Claire, how the, you know, the overall organization Cabrera, like whoever, whoever's door you want to place that at. Like, that's on you, but, like, I don't know that we can call a player a flop when everybody this season has been so poor. Yeah, and I, and I totally uh, I totally get that. I think the difference maybe with Justin Dillon was just the expectations on him sure. as opposed to whatever, Zacharias, maybe a Rivas because maybe we weren't familiar with his game coming from the Eastern Conference. But Dylan, we know, had been tearing it up in our conference, so maybe that had something to do with it. But no, you're absolutely right. Nobody's really shown consistently. Um, for me, though, like I, I don't like this move. I just, again, I think for such an anemic attack to then give up that many goal contributions, while not many, still more <laughs> than most, is yeah. kind of strange for a center back who hasn't played much this season. Um and the reason given or that we've heard for the, the transfer is that Justin didn't fit the tactical setup that Wilmer Cabrera is looking to instill. And I also find that a little bit disheartening because Wilmer came on this show in June and said that he would adapt to the players that he had. Mm-hmm. And I don't and I don't mean that in any kind of disrespectful way. I'm just I'm just putting it out there. Like that is yeah. what he said. And so to to move on a player like this without a full season just feels a little bit harsh to me. Yeah. Um, but who knows? Maybe Dylan wanted the move as well. Maybe he felt that he wasn't uh, fitting in or contributing as much as he would like. I- I'm Actually, I'm almost certain he felt that way because I know that he's a, a consummate pro and knows that he could be playing better. Um, so, yeah, it's just a weird one for me. But obviously, Wahab, like I, I obviously hope he does really well. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have like defenders for days now, so it's actually not an area of concern like it once was, but again, in a team that can't score goals, like, are we going to play a back eight? Like, I'm really, (laughs) I'm not understanding. (laughs) I'm not seeing the vision quite yet. It doesn't mean it's not there. I'm just not seeing it. Sure. No, I, I think, I think that's, that's completely fair. I mean, when we talk about a team that scored 16 goals in 21 games so far this season, We've conceded 32, which, granted, not good enough, right? Like, we've conceded 32, but there are... Literally double. Yeah. And there are a handful of teams that are a lot higher in the standings than we are that have conceded 32 goals, like, or even 30, right? Which is not great, but they're scoring goals, which is the difference. Like, so, this team, in its current composition, and with... I, I, I almost think of it as like we've gotten to the point where this is a simple addition problem. And I talked about this on our live stream with like or not a simple addition problem, but it is a matter of of mathematics now of like we only have 13 points and there's only like 13 games to go in the season. We cannot draw our way out of last place. 
right? Like we have to start winning some games. And the only way we can do that is if we start scoring more than we've been scoring. Um, and a bunch of clean sheets might get us a couple of one nils, might get us a couple, of, but like clean sheets in USL championship are hard to come by anyways. And the way this team has played, like, I don't trust them to get clean sheets. The only way, like, I hate to say it, but like, Hutch, are you there? Because I need some, like, I need some three twos, some four threes. I, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I can't, I, I'm kidding mostly, but I mean, um, yeah. For those who don't know, John Hutchinson, also the, uh, the interim manager for Yokohama F Marinos at the moment. So, uh, a Which reigning, they're like a literal powerhouse in reigning Asian in Asia. Asian Champions League finalists. So uh, insane. Yeah. Anyways, um, but no, I th- I think like if if the thought is hey we just need to shore things up at the back, it's like hey no like at some point we got to start turning the screw on teams, and I mean I just can't think of the last time and maybe it's because we've only scored two goals over the last six games maybe it's maybe it's recency bias but I feel this whole season we haven't had an attack that has scared anybody and I mean that in a sense that like we have plenty of players who should scare defenses Amano Moreno on him, on his own should scare defenses but I don't think anybody is scared because the way that we build up is so easy to nullify. Um, and like we get so sort of caught in this pattern of lumping it long and just like, and we get kind of scared, I think, of playing with the ball. And it just doesn't, it doesn't unsettle anybody, which is, which is crazy to say. Um, and I don't think that's a personnel issue. I think it's, I think it's the way, the way the team's been playing this season. Yeah, no, you're right. I don't think anyone, well, certainly nobody comes to Southwest University Park fearing us. I mean, we've we've gone over this so many times of how our home form is absolutely tragic, um, and that has showed no signs of improving. Um, do we have I mean, a we just, wait? Do we have a win? We still don't have a win at home this year, right? I don't think so. Yeah, because our. Our last win was when was that? Um, our last win was a the one nil in San Antonio in June. In so on like, June fifth. <laughs> yeah. It's... So. Yeah. We haven't. We still haven't won at home. It's it's August. We haven't won a game at home this whole season. <laughs> crazy again and the home games are where the team makes money yeah and this team from what we're hearing is already in the red so it's like yeah it's just not good like yeah. it's, none of it is good none of it is okay a good trivia a good trivia bit to know for the future is going to be that this this locomotive team beat charleston in charleston Dog. That was when Wilmer was at the wheel. Like we were hype. We we were which, turning to the be whole fair, was around. like it was a it was an amazing like feat. Oh, it was great. <laughs> yeah, we felt but, uh, one speck of joy, and that was yeah. it. That's all. That's all you get. Yeah. Um. It's... The the other news that came through um, that I did want to mention. On on the uh, player acquisition front is that Locomotive did uh, the old the old uh, whatever Bravos Dosi Do um, and <laughs> <laughs> and brought over two lonies. Um so Arturo Ortiz uh, who many probably remember actually from his time at at Pumas and um, and uh, I think they won a league title during his time there if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then uh, Amari Escoto, uh, the other player joining. So Ortiz, a center back. So sort of on the in the same vein, Mika, you mentioned the fact that <laughs> we're now very flush um, with center back depth uh, between Aquai and uh, and and Ortiz. Um, Escoto, and we even f- signed that German lad. 
Oh yeah, Erd Dennis Erdman as well. Yeah. Um yeah. Another Colorado Springs player. So we've been shopping out in out in the uh the foothills of the Rockies, but um <laughs> but Amari Escoto joins uh forward He's played for a lot of teams in Mexico, but um, the 31-year-old joins um, having just about just about 320 odd um, league MX and uh, Ascenso appearances, um, throwing some leagues cup in there as well, um, and then and 70 goals and 10 assists to his name. Um, so not, not the most prodigious scorer, um, but well-traveled. And I guess if you look at the Juarez Loni's Escoto and Ortiz at 31 years old, uh, both at 31 years old, feel a bit more closer to Borelli, uh, Carijo type, uh, loans versus not to, not to put Escoto on the same level as, as, uh, as Leandro, because I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Christian would have my head for that, but um, <laughs> but uh, more experienced loanees than obviously like Navarra's and Palua felt um, like more developmental loanees where this feels like a chance to get a little bit more experience in the team. Yeah, I mean, 31 years old, been around the block, played, you know, at the highest level in in Mexico. So hopefully he can you know, contribute quickly. Cause that, that's what we need, right? We need results now, not yeah. like soon. Like we need results now um, just to keep some kind of like pride about this season. Cause again, <laughs> I don't know if the playoffs are even a thing, but um, yeah, Scotto is, is kind of an interesting one because like just looking at some of his like um, stats and things like that, he, I don't know exactly. And, and full disclosure, I've never watched the man play, but just from the numbers, like it doesn't seem like he profiles like in any like specific way necessarily. He's not the tallest, so not like super dominant. Um, I mean, not bad in the air, but not like dominant, right? Not sure. like a like a straight up like kind of like Justin Dillon type type uh, player. Yeah. Um, but looks like he can bring others into the play. Again, the experience is the thing that that I think really matters. Um, and it was important, I guess, to to really like find a replacement immediately for Justin Dillon. Because mm-hmm. again, like <laughs> second most goal involvements on the team, like you have to replace that somehow. And obviously Amando Moreno, I think Amando Moreno operates better playing off someone than yeah. like necessarily leading the line. So hopefully Escoto and him can develop some kind of chemistry. Yeah. And uh I think we saw, you know, we obviously saw the the first appearance off the bench from from uh, Andy Cabrera as well. So, um, in Memphis, and he did. I think it's I think it's fair to admit uh, that despite the fact that he doesn't, you know, end up making a difference in terms of the the score, there did seem to be a spark, uh, like in Locomotive's attack that we maybe haven't seen as much this year after he came into the match. Yeah, no, to be fair to to the new signing, yeah, I thought he did look bright, constantly showing for the ball, which I liked because I think that there's definitely been some people hiding from the ball in this team this season, so that was um, a breath of fresh air, Um, but obviously he just couldn't make an impact immediately, Um, and I think, you know, it would have been kind of tough to expect that from the kid, I mean, having just come back to North America to play and getting to grips with a new team, obviously being coached by his dad, like that's not new, but um, yeah, I thought that he, he looked bright and could offer something. Um, He's a lot like bigger than I remember. And I know it's been a couple years, so obviously, but he's definitely like filled out. Mm -hmm. Um, So he could be a force on the wing uh, for us and kind of like give, give a little bit of balance and, and ask different questions than a slight pacey Amando Moreno does. So um, yeah, I'm hoping that Danny can, can, you know, take the next step uh, in his playing career with locomotive. Um, and, and yeah, um, show, show the locomotive faithful why his dad has so much faith in him and, and, and you know, recruited him to the team. The, uh, I guess 
interesting um the one interesting thing in terms of in terms of roster construction is probably well it's probably the lack of signing a midfielder despite the like outs that occurred and obviously mm-hmm. we've had some like injury stuff and um got ourselves in some suspension trouble as well like at different points so obviously it seems like Bolu is back uh you know and and he'll still be involved but um it's kind of him and him and Calvillo and then kind of piecing things together in midfield otherwise um where I guess Robert Coronado was the one maybe addition that is ostensibly like in midfield at the moment yeah and he and he also i think against memphis was decent yeah um sometimes a little loose with the ball but also i think trying to make things happen um and again i think is he the one that we paid a transfer fee for so yeah it's a central um, valley for yeah so uh i think we'd be within our rights to expect something for that right so sure. um our our emory chan as it were yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> if you were on the stream if you know you know um but yeah no i think i think he was also like somewhat of a bright spot for us against memphis so um i mean mika with with miami coming up Without going too hard into the like, because I mean, this has been this is very much like a vibes, <laughs> a vibes show. Um, right. Without going too deep into like, because we, I mean, the record of Miami speaks for itself. They've we talked about it before we got on air, but I mean, they've lost thirteen of their last fourteen games. The only non-loss since their win, um, since their win on what was it, April twenty seventh. Um, against San Antonio, I guess odd fact is that both of these teams' last win came against San Antonio, so that's that's one for for Harry if you're listening. Um, Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Miami. So since April 27th, they've lost 13 of 14 games, and they have just a single draw, two two against Loudon on June 22nd. So. The crazy thing is that as poor as Locomotive have been, Miami is the only team in the league that has been worse over the same stretch. And they have been worse by actually a considerable distance. They're, I think it's pointless to say that there are must-win games for Locomotive because... It, it's gotten to a point where basically any game that they don't win is another nail in the coffin of the season. But just in terms of pride, there literally is no result that can be acceptable but the first home win of the season, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Miami ship goals. We can see goals. They ship goals. 53 goals against on the season. Crazy part is, though, they've still scored more than us. We are the lowest scoring team in the league. (laughs) I think I'm right to say that like both western and eastern conference so i mean miami at least have some shooters right um but yeah i mean anything that isn't three points is really just like the death knell of this season i think i mean this is and it's funny because like who's gonna be watching this other than like all the most sick people (laughs) (laughs) it's gonna be (laughs) it's gonna be us a handful of folk, like a handful of the diehards, right? Uh, in in eighth notch, and then John Morrissey, and that's <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> and John is the sickest of them all because he'll be like clipping the game up and yeah. being you know analyzing. Let's dig in. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. Yeah. Uh. This is a, this one is for the sickos for sure. Like. Got a strong stomach for this game. I, uh, yeah, I mean, you talked about Miami shipping goals. Um, they are shipping goals like they they are going one of the twenty four hundred vessels arriving at 
at the port of Miami. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyways, I uh, <laughs> I was like, how big is how much business is going through Miami? Because I almost made like a bad boys joke, but I decided to go with actual legitimate <laughs> shipping. Um. So so Miami Miami is tragic. Uh, the reality, I guess, of Miami, and one thing that. I think we'd be remiss not to mention the fact that Antonio Nocerino is going to be in Southwest University Park. And at one point, that would have felt like a very crazy thing to say out loud. And it still might be. Uh, but he does it as the manager of, of Miami FC, which it's weird to see a name as big as Antonio's associated with a club that is, that is this bad. Well, Miami is like an Italian like vanity project. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but yeah, Nocerino, I mean, she's he's had some career, made over a hundred appearances for Palermo, Dai Aguile. But um yeah, <laughs> it's uh it's a weird one. Ha- did Landon Donovan come to the swap? I believe he did with, with Los Dos. With with or, Los no, Dos wait, or with, with uh, uh, San Diego. San Diego. Wait. Now I'm trying to think because, because I feel like COVID. there was like a yeah there might have been a reason he didn't because we we at one point had said like that'd be wild that yeah. like landed Donovan's in the now I don't I'm trying know to remember he, he might have done but yeah no sure you know I mean <clears throat> and I I still remember him at Orlando City it wasn't that long ago when he was playing in MLS yep um but yeah I, I just I don't know what kind of like resources available to him at Miami. I mean, I know they're like on paper like a uh rich club, right? But yeah. I don't know exactly how much is actually um given to him. <laughs> but yeah. can I just say like real quick so 2 days ago, I guess Pitbull, like Mr. 305 himself, Purchase the naming rights to FIU Stadium, so it's going to be Pitbull Stadium. <laughs> 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 That's incredible. So Miami play in Pitbull Stadium, lit. What on earth? I did. I had not heard that. How is this not like? What? How is this not all USL Twitter is talking about? It went under the radar, I guess. But yeah, no, ESPN's reporting it, so it's got to be real. That's crazy. That is crazy. It seems like, I mean, obviously it's through FIU and stuff, but like Miami play there, so. (laughs) Oh, man, that's funny. So I was going to make a comment about the fact that there is a player on Miami who... I'm surprised Wilmer Cabrera has not been in for recently, or maybe he has, um, but Frank Lopez, who was at RGV uh, under Wilmer as well, but he will not play a part in this match um, because he was one of two players sent off uh, in Miami's F- uh, Miami FC's last game against Loudon, the 4-1 loss. Um, he was sent off in first half stoppage time um so for a second yellow card uh so he'll play no part as will um nicholas cardona will also not be taking part um due to well, thank suspension. goodness that's a good thing for us because i think frank lopez has been their standout right um as far as uh goal contributions so yeah yeah five goals three assists um for him and miami definitely not the deepest team in the league um, their bench gets pretty short, so I would say, in general, Lopez being out does blunt their attack uh, quite significantly, which hopefully, which hopefully goes in uh, in Locomotive's favor. the The players that we will definitely see: Rocco Genzano, who is a, I think he's like, yeah, he just turned he turned twenty in May, um, and he had joined from. Lycos or Potenza? Looks like. Oh well, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, I'm maybe not this sure. Isn't telling me everything. Potenza, I think, was where he actually was. Um, 
like their U19s or whatever. And then uh, Alan Gavilanes, who is, he was playing at Greenville last year um, in League One. And he's actually acquitted himself quite well, despite the fact that they are, they aren't very good. The, the North Plainfield, New Jersey native um, and Marist College alumnus. So got it. Good old Marist up there in the uh up there in in uh I don't know if that technically counts as Orange County or Rockland County up there, but you know Marist New York's is, isn't it Duchess County? Oh, it might be Duchess County. Yeah, probably New York geography. New York FTW. New York stuff. Um <laughs> so those are the couple of players to watch out for, but like I said. Frank Lopez not involved and uh, probably much to Wilmer's uh, delight. Maybe, maybe he made a call down to Miami before the uh, Loudon game. And <laughs> Frank, how about you sit this one out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can, we need all the help we can get, so I will absolutely take it. Um, but yeah, it's, this is just like the whoever. This is what I want to know: who in Vegas is putting money on this game? Like either which way, any for any reason. That is a that's sick. That is that is grounds for. I mean, far be it for me to judge judge people for what they do, but what I would say is that a bet on this game should trigger like an automatic call to some sort of gambling hotline. <laughs> 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 where it just automatically is like, are you okay? Did you mean to click that? Like, was that on purpose? Um, <laughs> are you placing this bet? Are you under duress? Like, <laughs> right. Blink twice. If you need assistance. Uh, you know who I often forget was a, a very good player for Miami over several spells? Dylan Mares. Yeah. Dylan Mares. And uh, I mean, one of the, one of the the legends and a and a friend of the a friend of the show, um, Miami FC once paid a transfer fee for uh, Richie Ryan. That's right. Yes, I think it remains one of the highest transfer pe- transfer fees paid, uh, for, like in domestic American soccer, uh, for a player between two and two uh, U.S. based teams. Or and North I mean, American based enough, teams, I think. He's a Rolls Royce of a midfielder, so they paid I wanna say eight hundred thousand dollars for his services from um Ottawa Fury, perhaps at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. NASL Halcyon days of NASL when when things were just flying <laughs> around. Like it was just it was nonsense. And uh, I think at that time, um I think at that time Ricardo Silva was uh, was making some kind of pitch to U.S. Soccer that he would imbe- invest like four billion dollars in U.S. Soccer if and like give them a TV deal if they implemented promotion and relegation. <laughs> oh, he tried. So, what a time! Well, Mika, I mean, I know we've covered a lot of ground with Locomotive, but is there anything? I don't know. Is there anything we're missing? <laughs> it just feels like I know we've been gone for a long time and it feels at once like there's been a lot that's gone on and nothing that's gone on. But is there <laughs> anything else that we need to chat about before we uh, we let the good people live their lives? No, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens on on Saturday. Um, the I guess the other thing that I wanted to <laughs> kind of shout out was Today was Whataburger's birthday. True. And it made me realize that I haven't had a single Whataburger like post dove <laughs> meal in like forever. So that was a sad realization. <laughs> so <but>. tragic. <laughs> Whataburger is literally missing out on business because of locomotives form. Yeah. Mountain Star keeping keeping the waist snatched. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I will say, I'm sure that Whataburger on uh, on Sunland Park, right? That's where, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that one on Sunland Park definitely felt definitely felt it when I moved away. Like, 
They were like, there's something going on in the numbers. Like, is it COVID? Just way less food, foot traffic. <laughs> is it COVID? What's going on? Like, no. I, uh, yeah. It is a shame, though, that there's no, I mean, obviously, it's <laughs> a little less Whataburger, probably good. And, like, at the same time, it's, it's not, it's not great when we haven't had a reason to enjoy it. Um, but yeah. Gosh, well, happy bu- happy birthday to Whataburger and um, and <laughs> to a uh, real one. I do I do want to say I guess in the, in the way of closing, like to anybody who's listening to this, because we know it's been a slog. We know that we haven't been around as much this season. We know that the season has been brutal, and I do want to say that like at the end of the day locomotive as an entity and as a as an organization as a sporting organization like they cannot exist without you right like you are the fans you are at the end of the day you are what makes locomotive what it is and so i just want to say that like to anybody listening to this thank you for giving a shit like thank you for caring about the club and uh i am at the end of the day, confident that like the power that you have as fans will like move the club in the right direction. And I think that that is like, I think however long it takes to get back on stable ground and get back to where we know this club can, um, I do think that those days are ahead still. So um, it may take a while. It may take a lot of suffering on the way. But I do think that this club can get back to uh, to where it's been um, competing for competing for trophies again. So, uh, yeah. Well said, Phil. Well, well said. And I obviously I echo those sentiments 100 percent. I mean, at the end of the day, this is not their club. They are stewards of the club. This is our club. Yeah. Um, and I know that concept can seem a little weird in the context of, you know, the country that we live in and the way soccer is set up in this country. But I truly do think that we as fans should think that way, that this is our club and Mountain Star Sports Group are just the stewards of it, um, you know, and the owners on paper. But we make it what it is as fans. And so, yeah, Phil's absolutely right. Um, and yeah, I mean, we keep we keep trucking. We are we are gluttons for punishment. And <laughs> <laughs> It'll it'll continue. Yeah, it will. Um, well, it's good to be back in the end. Hopefully, a little bit of catharsis for anyone out there. A little getting a little frustration off the chest, and at the end of the day, still expectations around this game against Miami. Who knows? Maybe a little. Maybe a little bit of a. Th- there could be some catharsis on the pitch, um, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, and (laughs) against Miami, I think the expectation just has to be that it is the first home win of the season. Um, so we go in with, uh, I think with that expectation and, uh, and we can hold, hold this team to it, whichever way it goes. So, um, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, hope, uh, hope you enjoy, um, and, uh, I guess until next time, stay loco.